Chapter 4, Evaluating a Firm's Financial Performance. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at the purpose and importance of financial analysis. We're going to calculate and use a comprehensive set of measurements to evaluate a company's performance. And finally, we're going to describe the limitations of financial ratio analysis. So the purpose. It's a popular way to analyze the financial statements. When we use a ratio, it's much easier to compare um, a company to another company or a company to an average of companies um, in the industry or even to previous years. So ratio analysis is used heavily in determining the financial health of companies. We identify deficiencies in a firm's performance so we could take corrective action. Evaluate employee performance as well using these ratios and compare financial performance of the firm's different divisions. Uses of it within the company, we can prepare at both a firm and division level projections for the future, understand the financial performance of the firm's competitors, and evaluate the financial condition of a major supplier. So there's many different uses for financial ratios. That's why we have a whole chapter dedicated to it. They're used by lenders in deciding whether or not to lend to a company. We're going to look at some specific ratios that lenders would use. Credit rating agencies um, also in determining a credit worthiness of a company. The investors, the people who buy the stocks and the bonds of a corporation in deciding whether or not to invest in a company. We'll look at some specific ratios they all would be looking at. Major suppliers in deciding whether to um, or not to extend credit to a company. So they're going to look at the firm's financial ratios. So what are these ratios? Remember, a ratio is just a, a number that we calculate, but to give it meaning, um, we need something to compare it to, whether it be ourselves, um, a competitor, or all of our competitors, or some key standard that um, a particular decision maker would want. Question one could be, how liquid is the firm? Can it pay its bills? So how much cash does it have? So a liquid asset is one that can be converted quickly and routinely into cash at its current market price. So liquidity measures the firm's ability to pay its bills on time and indicates the ease with which non-cash assets can be converted to cash to meet financial obligations. Things like inventory, accounts receivable. How liquid is the firm is measured by two approaches. First, we compare the current assets of the company, so those assets that we deem to be used up in the coming year, with current liabilities, those liabilities we have to pay in the current year. So we're comparing the amount we have to pay with what we have to pay it with. Also, examining the firm's ability to convert accounts receivable and inventory into cash on a timely basis. So, a firm's current assets are compared with current liabilities in two distinct ratios. The first is the current ratio. Okay, they just threw the income statement in there in the middle. <laughs> Okay, and the balance sheet. So these are Coca-Cola's um, financial statements, and that's what you use to calculate your ratios. And if you wanted to open up your books to page 110 and 111, then you can easily um, access where the information is coming from, from the ratios. So you can calculate any company's ratios as long as you have these two key financial statements. The income statement, which shows revenues and expenses, and the balance sheet. Assets, liabilities, and equity. So the current ratio is calculated by taking the current assets of the company. So you would need to determine the current assets, which is on the balance sheet. For Coca-Cola, it's 32986 And divide that by their total current, current liabilities, 32274 And that gives us a ratio of 1.02. 
So if you wanted to look at it from a dollar to dollar perspective, what this is saying is that Coca-Cola has $1.02 in current assets for every $1 it has in current liabilities. Or they can pay their current liabilities 1.02 times. Um, or 102, they have 102 percent in current assets for 100 percent in current liabilities. So there's a couple of different ways you could look at it. Do they have enough in current assets to pay their current liabilities? Absolutely. So as it stands there, it looks pretty good. But now let's compare it to a competitor such as PepsiCo. PepsiCo's current ratio is a dollar 14. So Coca-Cola's not doing as well managing its current assets to current liabilities. It's not as liquid as Pepsi. That's what that's saying. The other um, ratio that tests how well um, we could pay current liabilities with current assets is the liquid ratio or asset test or quick ratio. Quick ratio compares cash and current assets that are very much like cash. So these are things like the cash, of course, and accounts receivable. Those two assets are added together, and we say they're the liquid assets or quick assets. We divide those by the current liabilities, and that will tell us how much we have in liquid or quick assets um, to pay our current liabilities. So in this case, the Coca-Cola's cash is 21675 and accounts receivable is 4466 Add those two together and divide by their current liabilities, and we get 0.81. So this is saying that we have 81 cents in quick assets, or very liquid assets, to pay $1 of current liabilities. Now, you could also look at it from the standpoint, if all of our current liabilities became due today, would we be able to pay them? And the answer is no. We would only have, we'd only be able to pay off 81% of them with our liquid or quick assets. So it's just, it's not, it's measuring how well we manage our, our um, cash here to pay our current liabilities. It might look okay or it might look bad to you, but if we don't have something to compare it to, we really don't know. So if we compare ourselves to Coca-Cola, theirs is 85 cents, so we're pretty close to them. They're doing a little bit better. Another perspective is to take a look at how well we convert other assets into cash. For instance, our accounts receivables. How long does it usually take us to collect our cash? We call that days and receivables. Or how often do we sell our inventory? Because the way we make money in a um, retailing or manufacturing business is to sell our inventory. And that's called inventory turnover. So those are our next, next set of ratio. How long does it take to collect the firm's receivables? Well, the way we determine that is we take accounts receivable divided by our daily credit sales. Now, daily credit sales would be determined by taking all the credit sales for the year and dividing it by the number of days in the year, 365 days. So if we take the balance of uh, Coca-Cola's accounts receivables at the end of the year, 4466, and divide it by their average day sales, okay, and that would be their sales for the year, assuming they're all on credit, divided by 365 days. So those numbers come off your income statement. That 45998 comes off the income statement, the very first line. The accounts receivable comes off the balance sheet. So make sure you can identify where those two are coming from. Um, first, do your denominator, your 45,998 divided by 365. And let me get my calculator out quickly here. And we can give you a final number on that, which would be, oh, I'm looking in my book, 120, no, it's not. Yes, it is 126 million. So what we're saying there is that we sell um, $126 million each day. Divide that number into our accounts receivables, and that tells you how many days it takes us, on average, to collect our accounts receivables from the day of sale to final collection. 
35.44 days. So we could have a standard at our company. We want that to be 30 days, and we could work to achieve that to get our money in faster. We can compare ourselves to Pepsi. Pepsi takes about 36 and a half days to collect their accounts receivables. Why is this important? The faster we get the money, the more money we have to, to pay our bills, the quicker we have it to pay our bills. Um, another calculation you could do is accounts receivable turnover. And that tells you how many times a year you collect on your accounts receivables. We roll them over, in other words. So if you take your annual credit sales, which was the 45998 and divide it by the balance in accounts receivables at the end of the year, the 4466, that will tell us how many times a year we collect our accounts receivables, which would be 10.3. Pepsi collects as theirs about the same amount. So we're in line with our competition. How long does it take to sell our inventory? How many days on average? That's called days in inventory. We take the balance of inventory off the balance sheet and we divide it by the daily cost of goods sold. Well, how would you get a daily cost of goods sold? Get the cost of goods sold for the year off the income statement, which is 17889 and divide that by 365 days. So that will give you 49.01. So the daily cost of goods sold is 49.01. Divide that into the 3,100,000, and it takes, on average, 63 days, 63.25 days, to sell our inventory from the date of purchase to the final selling day. So it sits on our shelves for 63 days. Pepsi's is 37 days, significantly quicker. What's the big deal there? Inventory sitting on your shelf is doing nothing. It does not earn money unless you're selling it. Pepsi is selling theirs 37 days, replacing it and putting more. They, they keep selling and selling and selling. Where for us at Coca Cola, it's taken 63 days. So there's a real problem with our inventory management. And this is a key indicator. So we can go and find out what's wrong and correct it. Remember, Coke and Pepsi are soda. They have the same customers, okay? They have the same suppliers. They should have almost the same type of manufacturing process. So why is that? There has to be a reason. We're, we're comparing apples to apples here. We're not comparing apples to gorillas. Okay, not, you know, we're not comparing soda to computer sales. It's the same industry. Inventory turnover is like accounts receivable turnover. It's going to tell us how many times a year we sell out our inventory. So we take cost of goods sold from the income statement and divide it by our inventory balance from the balance sheet. And in this case, Coca-Cola sells out their inventory 5.77 times a year, where Pepsi sells theirs out almost 10. So twice that. Very interesting. So just to go back. How liquid is the firm? Can it pay its bills? We look at the current ratio and the quick ratio. We look at how quickly we, we collect our money, how many times a year we collect our money on accounts receivables. We look at how many days it takes us to sell our inventory and how many times a year we sell out our inventory. So when we answer those questions, then um, we can answer that question. The next question, are the firm's managers generating adequate operating profits from the company's assets? Remember, investors give the company money, whether it be the creditors giving money to buy assets and use the assets, or it be stockholders. Remember, stockholders and creditors are the two who fund the company to buy the assets. The company must use the assets to generate a profit. So what kind of return is the company producing when they use the assets? That's what we call operating return on assets. 
And the return is always calculated as a percentage, like a return on your savings account is an interest percentage. Operating profit margin will tell us um, how well we're generating profits off our sales. Total asset turnover will look at how many times we use up assets when we generate sales. We'll see that. And fixed asset turnovers focuses on what they call fixed assets or plant assets. So we'll look at those in more detail now. So one more time. Debt and equity fund assets. Assets is what produces profits. So the operating return on assets. What we're saying is, what's the overall interest being earned to the people who give money? What's their overall return? Whether it's creditors or stockholders. And the way we measure that is we take the operating profits of the company. We get that off the income statement. Be careful. That is um, underneath total operating expenses. So it's 9707. Make sure you could identify that. Because that's the true profit from operating the business every day. Operating profits. And we divide that by the total asset. Total asset. Not current assets. Total assets. All the assets we own. This company produces a 10.5% return on all of its assets. In other words, if this was your savings account, the amount of interest you would earn is 10.5%. Okay? Pepsi is generating a 13.7% for their um, investors, whether they be creditors or stockholders. So this is a general overall return on all that money. I'm going to skip over this one. Let's go to operating profit margin. The operating profit margin examines how effective the company is managing its cost of goods sold and operating expenses, two key expenses of a, of a, of a company. Their cost of goods sold and their operating expenses. So we take the operating profits of the company and divide it by sales. What's left over after we pay all of our expenses? Operating profit. Let's divide that by the total amount of money we make. So we take the 9707 again and divide it by the total sales. So we retain in our profits 21.1% of our sales. So how well are we controlling our expenses? Well, remember, we're comparing ourselves to a, com to a competitor. They have the same type of expenses as us. Their operating profit margin is 14.5%. So it appears like Pepsi has a better hold or management of their expenses than does our or I'm sorry, Coca-Cola does than Pepsi. Because we're taking more of our sales as profit. 21.1% compared to 14.5% from Pepsi. Total asset turnover is found by saying how much in sales do we generate from our total assets? Okay? If we take our total sales and divide it by our total assets, we generate 50 cents in sales for every dollar of assets. Now, is that good or bad? Let's compare ourselves to Pepsi. Pepsi generates 95 cents in sales. So it looks like they're more efficient with using their assets in generating sales than Coca-Cola is. Coca-Cola should be generating more in sales um, because their competition is. Fixed asset turnover. Fixed asset is another word for plant assets. Okay? Or plant and equipment, which is on your balance sheet. We take sales. So how much sales are we generating from our plant or fixed assets? Um... 45,998 divided by 14,633, which is our net plant and equipment, um, 3.14. So we are generating 3.14 in sales for every $1 we have invested in these plant and equipment assets. This is lower than PepsiCo. So how well are we using our plant assets to generate sales? 
profitability ratios. Okay, so this is an overall analysis here. We saw um, our operating return on assets is really a combination of our operating profit and our total asset turnover. Okay, total asset turnover with all of those three combined, those three bottom ones, accounts receivable turnover, inventory turnover, and fixed asset turnover, that's really our total asset turnover. So you, you can look at total asset turnover in terms of those three numbers. And operating profit margin times total asset turnover gives us our operating return on assets. So these ratios are all interrelated to one another. But that's what they all mean and are defining. How is the firm's financing its assets? So that's our next question. How, where are we getting the money from? Okay, and how well are we financing the assets? We're going to look at the debt ratio and the times interest earn ratio. This ratio indicates the debt ratio. How much of the firm's assets are still being paid on through debt or are financed by the debt of the company? So we take all of the debt, total liabilities, off the balance sheet and divide it by total assets. So make sure you can find total liabilities and the total asset amount. When you divide that out, that tells us, in this case, 67.1% of Coca-Cola's assets are still encumbered by debt, or we still owe on those. So for every $1 in Coca-Cola's assets, they still owe 67 cents. Now, is that good or bad? Well, 75% are encumbered at PepsiCo. So for every one dollar of assets, they are on 75 cents. So we're doing better debt-wise. We're financing more of our assets with shareholder money than creditor money at Coca-Cola. And that's good because creditors demand interest payments and they demand repayment. The other ratio to determine how is a firm financing its assets is times interest earned. And this is a ratio really looked at by creditors because they want to know not only, well, they look at the debt ratio to make sure, can you pay the money back? How much do you owe on your assets? But they also want to know, can you pay your interest? So what they do is they look at operating profits because that's where you're going to get the money to pay for your interest. You can't borrow money to pay the interest. You can't ask the shareholders to give you money to pay the interest. You're not going to sell assets to pay the interest. No, you're going to generate sales and use part of that money to pay your interest. So if we take that operating profits from the income statement and divide it by your interest expense from the income statement, it will tell us how many times we can pay the interest from those operating profits. So the more times you can pay them, the more comfortable a creditor will feel that you can pay it. <laughs> right? So PepsiCo can only pay theirs 10 times, where Coca-Cola is in a better position. They could pay theirs 20 times. So it looks like their debt situation is much better than PepsiCo. <sighs> okay. You could read through that. The next question is, are the firm's managers providing a good return on the capital that the company's shareholders give them? So, the company gets money from the creditors, which we just looked at, but it also gets from the shareholders. So now the shareholders want to know, or potential shareholders, how well does the company manage the money we give them? Are they earning us a return? And the first calculation is called the return on equity. So what we do is we take the net income because that is the money that's generated for the stockholders. Net income. The company takes the shareholders' money, buys assets, generates net income with those assets. So we take net income divided by all the money the stockholders have given to the company, which is total common equity. So that's the common stock amount on our balance sheet and retained earnings. And I'm just flipping back to my balance sheet quick because I'm not on that page. All right. And we only have one kind of stockholder here, and that is common stockholders. 
So when we do that, the return on equity for Coca-Cola comes out to be 23.4%. PepsiCo is 37.1%. So here's how you can look at that. If this was a savings account and, and um, shareholders gave their money to Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola would earn them 23.4% interest on their money. Pepsi, though, is earning 37.1%. So as a potential investor, where would you want to put your money? Okay, I'm going to keep going with this. Are the firm's managers creating shareholder value? Well, we could look at market value ratios, which we call the price-earnings ratio, and the economic value added. So this is more information the shareholders will use. These ratios indicate what investors think of management's past performance and future prospects. The price-earnings ratio measures how much investors are willing to pay for a dollar of reported earnings. So how we determine that is we take the market price per share of stock at the end of the year, if, if that's the date we're looking at, divided by the earnings per share calculation. Remember, earnings per share is how much earnings the company made for one dollar of common stock. So you would need to know that number. And it's usually on the income statement. In this case, Coca-Cola's market price of the stock on this particular date was 2014 is $42. Their earnings per share is $1.60. And that's right off the income statement. So what this is saying is 26.25. The company, the investors are willing to pay $26.25 for $1 of earnings per share. Here's another perspective of looking at it. Let's say the company came out a couple months ago and said their earnings per share, they expect it to be $2.60. But then on December 31st, they find out it's $1.60. What could we expect to happen to the price of the stock? The price of the stock will drop $26.25 because the market will react. Um, investors value one dollar of earnings per share, so it went from two sixty down to one sixty down their earnings per share. That one dollar at twenty six dollars and twenty five cents. Investors will react to that earnings per share announcement. If earnings per share goes down, you're learning you're earning less money for one for one share of stock, right? You thought it was two dollars and sixty cents. Now you're only earning a dollar sixty. So it's a one dollar drop the price stock will drop. What's the value placed on one dollar of earnings per share? Twenty six twenty five. Now Coca Cola, theirs is twenty two oh nine. So investors are willing to pay more for earnings per share for Coca Cola than Pepsi. The price book ratio compares the market value of a share of stock to the book value. And really you can look at this calculation. It's not a big calculation anymore. I don't think people really look at it. But this, they do. The economic value added. Shareholder value is created. If the firm earns a return on capital, then what the shareholder requires them to earn. And that's called the required rate of return. So what it does is it attempts to measure a firm's economic profit rather than their accounting profit. So economic value added recognizes the cost of equity in addition to the cost of debts. And here's how we find it. We take our operating return assets minus cost of capital times our total assets. Operating return on assets is 10.5%. So this is on page... Sorry. It's on page 133. 
Okay. Total assets are ninety-two million twenty-three. So we got it. we already calculated our operating return on assets, ten that percent. That's what we are now. Total assets are ninety-two million billion, really. Ninety-two point twenty-three billion. We assume the cost of capital is ten percent. Okay, so that's what we're saying. Um, that is expected. The cost of capital. That's what they're expecting. Ten percent. So, what's the economic value added? Four hundred sixty million. So, this firm. If you look on page one thirty-three. Okay, la, 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 la. second sentence. If the firm's market value is above the accounting book value, the management has created value for shareholders. And that's what happened here by a positive $460 million. But if the firm's market value is below book value, the management has destroyed shareholder value. And that's really what we are measuring. Okay? So... Let's take a quick look at the, the summary of these items, which is on page 136. A whole bunch of ratios measuring different things. First, firm for liquidity. How well can the company pay and generate cash to pay its current liabilities? First, the current ratio, then the asset test ratio. Current ratio, look to see how much in current assets there were to pay current liabilities. Asset test looked at just very liquid assets quick assets, things that can be converted to cash quickly, cash and accounts receivable. Days and receivables tells us how many days on average it takes us to collect on our accounts receivables. Accounts receivable turnover tells us how many times a year we collect our accounts receivables. Days in inventory, how quickly we sell our inventory. So how many times, or I'm sorry, how many days it takes to sell our inventory. The quicker we sell it, the, the um, quicker we can replace it and sell it again. And then inventory turnover tells us how many times a year we sell at our inventory. Remember, num those numbers alone mean nothing. We need to compare them in either to our own benchmark, our competition, or an industry average. In this case, we did a competitor, PepsiCo. Operating profitability. How well does the company earn a profit? So we have operating return on assets. Measures how well we use our assets to generate a profit. Operating profit margin. How much of sales are retained as operating profit. Total asset turnover. How much in sales is created from a dollar of assets. Accounts receivable turnover, inventory turnover can be here again. And then our fixed asset turnover. How much in sales is generated for a dollar of plant assets. How, how does the company finance its assets with debt or equity? So we use debt ratios here to determine the amount that's financed with debt. Um, and then the times interest earned to determine how many times the company could pay its interest with operating income. Return on equity determines how well the company is using the equity of the company to generate a return to the shareholders. Net income measures the actual return divided by total common equity. That's the percentage return. And then creating shareholder value. Price earnings ratio tells you how much the market values a dollar of earnings per share. And EVA tells us um, the added value beyond accounting profit that the management is making for the shareholders. So remember, it's very important. These calculations are great. And we do them in, an, in the ratio form so that we can compare to past performance, um, budget, what we expect, to our competitors, to our industry. But there are limitations. And those are on page 38. It's sometimes difficult to identify the actual industry you're in. The published peer group or industry averages are only approximations. 
they may not provide a desirable target ratio either. Just because you're doing what everybody else is doesn't mean that's what you want to be doing. Accounting practices differ widely among firms. You've got to keep that in mind too. That will skew ratios. So maybe one company's using LIFO and you're using FIFO for inventory management. That's going to change your numbers. A higher low ratio does not automatically lead to a specific conclusion. And I like to compare this. When I talk about ratios, I use the analogy of going to the doctor. Um, you can look at the ratio analysis as really trying to determine the financial health of a company in whole. When you go to a doctor, the doctor doesn't take your blood pressure and say, oh, your blood pressure is bad, you're going to die. Okay, so we don't make an overall analysis or a specific conclusion based on one input. And that's what they're saying there in number five. You've got to look at all the ratios and take them as a whole before you make a conclusion. Really, a lot of these ratios lead us to more questions that need to be answered so that we can get more information to better make a decision. Seasons may bias the numbers in the financial statements as well. So if you're a seasonal business especially. Um, so we've got to keep that in mind when we're looking at our financial uh, ratio analysis. But this is a great tool for helping to assess how well a company is doing. So we want to make sure you're familiar with these key terms and these ratio calculations. But not only that, but what they mean. Because in the end, in a finance area, that's what you're going to need to worry about. Software can calculate anything, right? But it's when we need to um, assess what they mean that the importance of them really come into play. Okay, so um, thanks for hanging in there with me on this uh, Chapter 4. And um, post any questions you may have.